I'm going to give a brief overview. So they, they told me there would be people here who knew little to nothing about genetics. And um, so I've got a brief review of just the kinds of genetics you need to know to understand where I'm going with genomes in everyday medicine. I'm going to talk about where we are in, with genomes in medicine today, briefly, but try to sell you on some of the ideas that I think are going to dominate genomes in medicine in the future, um, and, and I think in the near future, <laughs> frankly. Um, and, and the, it's in the nooks and crannies, it's in the things we don't think about, not the, the sexy N of one cases um, that get all the press. So, so by way of background, genomic discovery for rare Mendelian diseases, I'm gonna, you gotta think of the genetic architecture. And architecture is a really good um, metaphor for this, for what we're, we're trying to do in genetics. So understand everything about um, the men, simple Mendelian disorders. So you have a large effect. Um, so often just one gene, big, big brawny effect. And sometimes there's a couple of other genes, maybe from the same family, or maybe you have a, a sort of a set of similar conditions, um, some of the methylmalonic acidemias, for example, um, from different genes, but with similar phenotypic features. But, but the emphasis is on uh, single gene disorders, relatively rare mutations with large effects. And finding the cause of a rare Mendelian disease has often been, we've often used the analogy of seeing a single misspelled word in uh, an encyclopedia. And here's a sentence you'll never see in an encyclopedia, but as an example. And you really want to, because, you know, genes actually come in pieces. You, you only think of the gene as the whole sentence. And, and what you get is just a single misspelled word um, in a sentence. So if this is what it's supposed to read, when we've got the mutation from an O to an A, um, it's what geneticists would call a missense mutation. So we are still able to make a functioning protein. It's not quite the right protein and it's not conveying the original message and it may not be conveying nearly as much biology as, as, as we, we needed from it. There's another way we can get a, a, a mutation, and this would be more analogous to a gain of function mutation. And, you know, and, and this happens. So you get a mutation in a protein and it just does something completely different. If it was, you know, maybe it was a receptor and it binds a completely new protein just due to a single mutation um, in, in a key binding, a key part of the binding side of the, the receptor. So, so these are the sorts of mutations that give rise to relatively rare Mendelian conditions. And we can find these really well now. We, you know, we, we have now sequenced literally millions of people and sequencing costs are continually declining. The automated nature of sequencing is increasing our ability to do this really quickly, and we're going to talk about some of those examples. But, but of course, most conditions that put people into hospitals, um, that send people to doctors and medical centers, are, are not actually rare. Um, they're common diseases with more complex patterns of transmission. It's that they may have some clear genetic component in that relatives of somebody who's affected has a higher risk of being affected than the general population. But it's not, it's not like autosomal recessive cystic fibrosis or autosomal dominant Huntington's chorea. And when I was young and we, we first started doing genetics in more complex traits and, and common diseases, we thought that we'd be in a city like Chicago with, there'd still be some big things, there'd be some genes, you know, some 10-ish additional genes with somewhat smaller but still pretty big effects. And then after 
in the last 10 years or so, <laughs> we're in Levittown. I mean, for common diseases, the things that take most people, take most people's lives, put most people in hospitals, send, send people to doctors, the architecture is much more polygenic. We have many contributing genetic factors, relatively small effects, and nearly equal in size, hard to understand what biology they're trying to tell us about. And that's, so that's about the last 15 years of human genetics um, encapsulated for you. And if somebody had been able to tell me the answers to these questions 20 years ago, I'd have been really disappointed because I would never have believed that we'd have millions of genomes fully sequenced and not know more biology for the diseases that put people into hospital beds. And we know, we've learned a lot of biology. Don't make it, and I'm thrilled. I mean, I would never have believed that we'd have millions of people whole, whole genome sequenced um, during my lifetime uh, based on where we started out when I was a graduate student. But everything is more complicated than you think, than we think, I mean, always. You just keep peeling, peeling back layers of the onion and finding more complexity. And I think, um, so, so part of the challenge is in our discovery research, getting enough biology to be confident about doing translation. Um, and and so, so that's part of the complication in the space we're in now. Moreover, as we did more and more genetics in common disease, we discovered it's not the misspelled words. <laughs> it's not protein coding changes that drive most of common disease. You should think of it at more as the punctuation. Um, it, the music analogies are really good too. So I, I'm in Nashville now, and so it's the crescendos. It's the, the changes in tempo. It's not the notes. It's not the words. It's, it's the punctuation. So here we've got a couple of sentences. Eating lots of sugar and fat is good for increasing your risk of di diabetes. Instead, eat lots of fruits and vegetables. And Without changing a single word, just the punctuation, we've got eating lots of sugar and fat is good. For increasing your risk of diabetes, instead, eat lots of fruits and vegetables. So yeah, <laughs> pretty big change in meeting. And, but also indicative of what actually happens in things like diabetes, where you know, for some of the, the genes that have been discovered and, and getting to the physiology of them, talking about a change in resting metabolism where you burn 30 fewer kilocalories a night in your sleep. That's the entire effect, which is like nothing. In the homeostasis of, of burning calories, that's, that's really puny. But over a lifetime, adds up. And over a lifetime, that's going to increase, as a, in this particular example, increases not just overall body fat, but very specifically, um, central obesity, very specifically, um, fatty liver. And, and so the, this is the sort of small effect that over a lifetime adds up to increase the risk of a late onset disease. And, um, and the fact that these are non-coding variants, and I'm not even gonna call them mutations, you got to think of them as really common. I mean, commas are common. Periods are common. Punctuation in, in music, tempo, crescendo, is a lot of what we think of as, as the, the meat of things, not just the particular notes. So you got to think of this as really still part of the fundamental biology. But it's not that the proteins are changing. It's, it's the amount... It's the timing of production. It's maybe when and where things are, are being produced. Um, and, and of course, always, always the amounts. Too much, too little. So today, we're in a space of 
doing more and more and more discovery, more and more and more rapidly because of the changing technologies, the tools we can bring to bear now, the much lower cost of getting data at volume. And translation's hard because you really do need to know as much biology as possible if you're going to impact people's lives with what you think you have learned. And so we're behind in the translation. Discovery's up here. We're, we're, we're building a lot of, of baseline information. But we, it, the translation is harder and slower. But let's talk about where we are um, with genomes in medicine today. And today in most university medical centers, there's some kind of program that gets people information on pharmacogenomics. So the, the genes that produce drug metabolizing enzymes, transporters, the genes involved in um, how effective any given drug is, that all comprises what we think of as pharmacogenetics. So there's a, a surprising amount of, so that the drug metabolizing enzymes, polymorphisms in these genes have unusually large effects given how important this is. But of course, pharmacogenomics is really a gene by environment interaction. You take a drug and some genetic variation has an impact on how, for example, how, um, how much of the drug you need to take because of how fast you do or don't break it down. So let's see if I can, oh, yeah, yeah. So, so normal breakdown, sort of average dosing, but if you burn through the drug much faster, you probably are gonna need, um, more drug, uh, and if you break it down more slowly, you'll need less. So this G by E um, means that these alleles can be relatively common and have big effects and still not have that much impact in the population among those not taking the drugs that are metabolized by that gene, right? And so, so pharmacogenomics the benefit, the reason it's gotten, made its way into medicine is that it's more analogous to Mendelian type genes because there are relatively large effects at many of these key drug metabolizing enzymes, transporters that, um, that get the drug into cells for it to do its work. The efficacy that's going to be more related to how complex the genetics is and how many different pathways converge in driving disease. And actually, so, so drug efficacy tends to be a little bit more like a polygenic trait, whereas the drug metabolism and drug transport, a lot of those alleles have, have relatively big effects. But overall, pharmacogenetics is is being implemented now at scale. Part of the problem with pharmacogenetics is that historically insurance companies have wanted to reimburse only for point of care testing, which is really expensive and kind of a, a stupid way to do things. And so a number of institutions, certainly ours at Vanderbilt, basically did some machine learning kinds of approaches to identify people most likely to be prescribed any of the drugs that have pharmacogenomic indications that where you really should be tested before you're prescribed the drug. And there, there are not that many um, where, where it's really well established that you should be tested before you're prescribed the drug. And so the machine learning algorithms are, are quite good at identifying the people most likely to be prescribed any of those drugs. And you can do a preemptive sweep through all of the major pharmacogenomic variants. And, you know, 95% of us will have one or more alleles with big effects that would change what drugs we take or change how we take them. Um, and so, so this is a great example of genetics and genomics coming into medicine. Um, but, but this machine learning end of it 
I mean, the major factor that determines how good the model is is, you know, just incorporating age. Because the older you get, the more likely you are to be prescribed more drugs, the more things you have wrong with you. And so, really, um, getting people about somewhere between age 40 and 50 would catch, catch a lot of this. Another really important and, and popular way that, that genetics is seeing a lot of use is in these N of 1 cases. So sometimes, as in this example that I just pulled off the web, um, you're, you're talking about an infant who's, who's really sick, and they do a sequencing test right away, and whole genome sequencing can now be done, turned around with a full report in less than 12 hours. I mean, it's, it's, it's an astonishing thing to see, see the progress in this. And when there's a, not just a solve, but, but sometimes it gives you information on how, how the child needs to be treated. And that's great. Uh, I mean, it's just, it, it's amazing. But the truth is, this is still really unevenly reimbursed by insurers. And, and so certainly not every place is doing this. Um, Yes. In, yes, in this example. So, so yes, the, the, there are a number of programs in the United States now where essentially every baby in, in the NICU is going to be sequenced, um, looking for the common things that can make infants really sick at birth um, to try to catch them. And again, not all of those things can be treated. And that, that's also a help to the physicians in the NICU because they know, they know, if they know the cause and know there isn't anything to be done yet, well, that's important information too in terms of, suppose, you know, we, we used to try to convince insurance companies of short-circuiting the diagnostic odyssey um, because without the genetics, you, you keep going and looking for things that it might be. What do you, you know, what do you do? The problem is that <laughs> the, the solve rate for N of 1 studies varies widely. And, and the main thing that determines that is your criteria for when you are willing to sequence somebody. And the more indiscriminately you do, the lower the solve rate is. But even among solved cases, only about 10% of them involve a gene for which we already know of some kind of therapeutic pathway or target. That should increase over time, and it is increasing slowly. It'll get faster. All of these things are accelerating the more information we have. But part of the problem is, so we, you know, geneticists were trying to, and are still trying to get this done more widely so that we're sure to catch everybody who will benefit. And insurance companies are reluctant because they keep saying, mm, doesn't really stop the diagnostic odyssey because parents of these kids just keep looking for ways to make them better. And yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I, that'd be me if, if it was mine. So I, I think, so that's an important point. And, and part of the problem is also this real unevenness in the solve rate, very different um, strategies for who should be genetically tested at different sites. And so um, one, of the, one of the recent highlighted papers um, was from uh, young people at Vanderbilt. So we have the largest university-run biobank in the world. And that gives us a, a large number of people with DNA samples that we can study in the context of research attached to electronic health records that go back more than 30 years because Vanderbilt built their own electronic health record. And so the, these guys developed a machine learning algorithm based on people who'd been sent for genetic testing to very precisely identify other people in our electronic health record system who should be genetically tested, whose phenome was so similar to those who 
did have genetic testing ordered, that when you look at the genetics done in those people, you get the same solve rate as in those that clinicians sent for genetic testing. So, so the, the solve rate is something that we now can go after with machine learning. You know, we can set it at any level where we can build a good training set from and, and be pretty much assured that we could apply this across the medical center in a way that would say to insurance companies, look, we get a 25% solve rate, and that's what we'll get with this algorithm if, if we go ahead. And, and if, if you need to take that to 35%, we, you know, that, that's doable within the, within the parameters um, that, we, that we have here. It also creates opportunities for, you know, it used to be that drug companies were uninterested in rare diseases, in creating drugs to cure or improve rare diseases. But, you know, the, the drugs for cystic fibrosis for out of Vertex really changed all of that. And more and more drug companies are willing to go after these. And, the, and of course, drug technologies change all the time. It's really possible to go after some of these rare conditions. And so another thing they're doing with this algorithm is helping find these rare people who are going to benefit from newly developed drugs that target some particularly rare condition. And of course, the N of 1 studies are not just babies. They're also um, people and, you know, the um, NIH program for undiagnosed, the Undiagnosed Diseases Network, the Mendelian Sequencing Centers, all of those involve um, discovering new diseases for which rare large effect variants are contributory. There's a relatively small list of of such genes, such, such genes and, and um, mutations for which there's real actionability where you can really do something um, if you know you're a carrier that is going to improve long-term health, improve outcomes, et cetera. It's something in the range of 50 to 60 plus now. And, and so, so another part of this N of one studies are to expand this, not just to the people who already have disease, but you could do this in everybody and basically report back the information on things that are actionable. And so there's a number of very large-scale studies now that have done that, and this is the sort of thing also being rolled out at many university medical centers um, around sort of genomes in medicine now. So return of results for rare large effect variants that are actionable. And <laughs> the emphasis on actionable tells you exactly where the problems are because we know of many more rare large effect variants that we're sure will cause diseases. But when there's nothing that you or I or any physician can do, there's currently less willingness to, to go large scale on returning those results to people. And it's a, it's, a, it's a subject of a lot of discussion, ethics, as it should be. Because some people still want to know because they want to make financial plans. They want to, they want to know. Some people don't want to know at all. And, and these are the kinds of things, the kinds of discussions we have to be having in our society with, with everyone, and that means educating everyone about where we are in genetics at any given point of time, which is a moving target. The other space that's getting a lot of play now are, are what's called polygenic risk scores. So this is going back to the common diseases and all of the common DNA variants that contribute small effects over many, many, many genes. Um, that in, and in ultimately increase people's risk of disease. So this is a representation of polygenicity and how we go about what, what it looks like to calculate a polygenic risk score. Each of these is a person, and you see this sort of normal distribution, sort of what we expect for, um, yeah, what we expect um, for what happens when we have many independent and identically distributed um, things coming together 
So in this case, alleles that increase risk um, within an individual, you can see most of us will fall into this middle range where there's, you know, we don't, we, we're just in the middle of risk. The, the polygenic risk scores really have only, ha have information, meaningful information to return to patients in the tails of the distribution, both the high risk and the low risk. So the, the high risk because there might be strategies, there might be medications, there might be screenings, you know, depending on what the disease is. But, but we have to think about the low risk too, because part of how we just would justify using things like this in medicine is to target better our screening capabilities. So if we're gonna screen more people who have high risk for prostate cancer or breast cancer, we have to think about for people in the very lowest end of things, not screening them because we can't just do more and more and more based on the genetics. We have to be thinking about how we deploy healthcare dollars in the most effective ways. And that, that's always a problem in the US Medical Center where everything is so litigious. You know, saying a physician to a physician, yeah, we really shouldn't be screening the low risk people. And they're like, yeah, okay, when you get sued, <laughs> when you're the one who's gonna be sued if somebody breaks through with, with this cancer, then, then you can decide. Until then, I'm going to decide. So it's a, it's a complicated thing to, to, to think only about what we do in the high-risk situation. All of us are, these are common alleles, as I'm going to show you in the next slide. All of us have lots of these alleles. We're all going to die of something. And the, I'm, no, I mean, we are. And, and you, can't, you can't exactly pick your poison. You may have no, um, no increased risk at all for, for some common conditions and, and, and cardiovascular risk is your, is your problem. It may be breast cancer, it might be prostate cancer. We all are high risk for some things. And some of us have the, have the bad luck to be high risk for a lot of things. Some of us have the good luck to have very little risk for most things. Those will be the people who absent getting run over by a bus will have great longevity. But here's an example. So I did a review with Peter Vischer and Naomi Ray in Australia to try to explain where we are with the, the polygenicity. So these are data from the UK Biobank, 500,000 people. And if you just take two people from the very lowest risk um, for type 2 diabetes here and for breast cancer here, and then two people from the upper centile um, for high polygenic risk to type 2 diabetes and high polygenic risk to breast cancer. <coughs> so the gray dots indicate low, the, that they have, they're homozygous for the low risk allele. The blue dots indicate they have one risk allele and one non-risk allele at that particular <coughs> polymorphism. And then the goldish red dots indicate they have two high risk alleles at that particular site. And you can see, if you look at the first focus on the diabetes, there's a little more gray down here and a little more red and green up here. These are 500,000 people apart in risk, right? I mean, and it's not a very big difference. And you see plenty of SNPs down here where people have two copies of the risk allele and they're the lowest risk people in the population. That's because these are really common alleles. These, many of these are the most common allele. They're present in 90% of us, 95% of us. So, so lots of us carry risk for, for any of these conditions. And you, gotta, you can't think of these as mutations that cause disease. These are common ways that our, that our body has of regulating general systems. How much your immune re system responds when you get an infection, for example, as we just been through a pandemic and saw a lot of population variability in that. And, and so you want to respond, but you don't want to over-respond. 
So, so a lot of these polymorphisms in part vary in the population because it's a good thing for our population to have a lot of variability in the context of changing environments. Changing environments in the context of infections, humans have been dealing with forever. And that's one of the most common things that drives natural selection, pathogens. Um, and you know, we've been seeing evolution in action now for a couple of years and are plenty tired of it. But you can see for, for both the breast cancer here and the diabetes here, these are very common alleles. And there's, there's more risk in the highest risk people than in the low risk people. But it's, it's not so hugely different. So in, in this, it really just shows you sort of the lowest decile of risk for inflammatory bowel disease, the middle decile, and then the highest decile of risk. And that, that's a pretty steep curve, but it's a rare disease, and so that, that's why you see it so low here. Alzheimer's is, is quite common. And while this looks really dramatic for the upper decile, almost so half of that entire risk is just the APOE polymorphism, APOE4 allele that's a well-known, relatively common allele, has one of the biggest effects for a common disease um, that we see. And it, it's, it's one of these really interesting polymorphisms that does a lot of things. It affects lipid levels. Um, it affects Alzheimer's risk. Has a lot of pleiotropic effects. And in fact, the allele that increases risk for Alzheimer's is actually the ancestral allele at this polymorphism. I mean, you know, at this this site. So, um, so the, the it's the newer alleles associated with lower risk um, that are that are coming along in the population. So the way the the right way to think about these, as I said, this is about the punctuation, and so so we're when we look at omics sorts of data, some molecular trait, for example, gene expression, we might see a fairly big effect at a at a particular polymorphism that's associated with disease on the expression of the gene. But if we move down the food chain here to how much, for example, how much protein is present, um, that tends to be a smaller effect. The further away we get from the actual molecular mechanism, the more attenuated the overall signal tends to be. Whoops. Um, so, so from transcriptome, so gene expression being pretty dramatically affected by this SNP, protein being less affected, and then, you know, so the actual blood pressure measurement and whether somebody's diagnosed as having hypertension, a lesser effect still. So the further away we get from the direct action of whatever the, the way this is caused, the more attenuated the effect tends to be because there are a lot of other factors that are impinging on whether someone gets diagnosed with hypertension, not all genetic by any means, diet. Um, so BMI is a big predictor. And, and so, but, but of course, BMI is highly heritable too. The obesogenic environment in which we live is, is, a, is partly a driver of, of the number of us that have hypertension these days. And so, so the, all of those things are, are what contribute to these effects being so much smaller than what's happening up here at the level of, of the expression of this gene. So, so what are they doing with polygenic risk scores in medicine today? Well, there's some big studies looking at how we translate those. And, and so there's, as we talked about, a lot more information in the tails of the distribution than there is for most of us. So in most polygenic risk scores that any of us would ever look at in our medical records, we're gonna be you know, within a standard deviation of the mean, right? Certainly within two standard deviations of the mean. And only on a few things will we, will we be in one of these tails of really high risk or really low risk. And, and they're focusing a lot of 
a lot more on the high risk end and trying to calibrate that with the risks associated with the rare variants. So, so when, when we think a rare variant has a big enough effect that we can do something about that it actually gets returned, it's often the case that the polygenic um, liability has the same treatment. So think of familial combined hyperlipidemia that can be treated with the drugs that affect lipid levels. And when a family is suspicious for having a high effect rare variant, it's appropriate to sequence them because their risk of having myocardial infarction as a consequence of their high lipids is high enough that there's a good return on that investment. But it turns out that absolute risk is no greater than what, what we see for just polygenic liability to hyperlipidemia in the people with the highest 8% of genetic risk. So that's a, that's a group that then we ought to be as aggressive for as we are with the people with familial combined hyperlipidemia mutations. One of the less appreciated features of polygenic risk scores is that they're dynamic. And a polygenic risk score built from the early Framingham data, for example, is not predictive of myocardial, myocardial infarction today in most US medical centers because the primary driver of risk of having a myocardial infarction was really high LDL cholesterol. We, that was discovered. There are drugs that treat it very effectively now. And so people whose primary risk for an MI was high LDL don't have that high risk anymore. And, but if you, if you use a polygenic risk score for um, triglycerides, that's actually predictive in data in current medical centers for a, a cardio event now because we don't control the triglycerides as well. And so in large samples, you can see that triglycerides are driving now a lot more of the risk. L, L, LP little a is as well. And this is a feature, not a bug. This is what we want to do. <laughs> it's a feature, not a bug. The fact that these are dynamic. We so would like in neuropsychiatric diseases that have drugs so good uh, that we can't predict who's going to develop schizophrenia or major depression. And, and, and so this is, this is something we can learn to use better to do medicine better. Because polygenic risk score for LDL cholesterol right now in a hospital could tell you which um, subspecialties are doing a great job with getting their patients on statins and which are not. Uh, so regardless of, of the information there, same thing with, with uh, polygenic risk score for cigarette smoking. It's predictive of myocardial infarction in people who smoke, but not in people who don't. But that data is poor quality in electronic health records because not all physicians ask about it. And you don't, you don't need to have good data. You can just look at whether the polygenic risk score is predictive of myocardial infarctions and, and that that clinic, whatever it is, is not good at getting their patients off of cigarettes because they're smoking whether or not we know it. So this dynamic nature of the PRS is a key part of, of how we have to think of genomes in medicine in the future. So the, we talk about everyday medicine, N of 1 is still rare. Pharmacogenomics, we'll all need it um, as we get older. But it's still a relatively small number of things. You don't need whole genomes for that. Clinical lab tests, the biomarkers that we use to, to decide when people are developing disease, how their disease is progressing, that's everyday medicine. Tests get ordered every day um, by physicians. And so one of the things that uh, we've been doing at Vanderbilt in our biobank, so one of my senior postdoc, uh, joined Leah Davis, one of our young faculty members, and, and one of her graduate students, to really build out some software tools that allow, would allow anybody with a biobank to really clean these 
laboratory values. So the, the electronic health records data that we have as part of everyday medicine are not the same quality that we're used to in research. There's a lot of <laughs> the physician scientists who convinced Vanderbilt more than 30 years ago to develop electronic health records was an engineer as an undergraduate and and his philosophy was, a test result is not truth, it's data. A physician diagnosis is not truth, it's data. It's all data to compute over to learn more about truth. And, and, and that, that is how medicine works. It's not that you, people get misdiagnosed with lupus. It's that, yes, there's a lupus diagnosis in there one time because because the physician thought that this set of, this constellations of symptoms that were being reported might be lupus, sent the patient for a lupus workout, workup. The only thing the physician can put into bill for is the lupus code because it was a full-scale lupus workup. But it was negative. And, and you got to know that. Similarly, lots of the test, the, the out-of-range test values are just mistakes in the lab. You get a repeat test and it's in the normal range. So, so it's all... It's all data. It's not perfect data. But it's the only data we will ever have to translate our discoveries. So we have to be able to do it in these data. So they developed this whole software pipeline for cleaning to do discovery research. And they were able to show that the laboratory values from clinical data can be made high enough quality that we get the same estimates of heritability. We get the same top signals in genome-wide association studies as with those same research quality measures. So, okay, so now we've got, so we have data on 120,000 people with laboratory values, and that's, there's a lot of labs ordered in those people. So what proportion of the lab values physicians order and interpret on at least a monthly basis do you think are heritable? I'm a geneticist, so you know what's coming. So for physicians, labs are shockingly heritable. So the blue shows the proportion of all common laboratory values that are heritable. And about half of those are quite highly heritable. Only about, a, as you can see, only about a third of them are, are, are not heritable, even in the size sample set that we can throw at it. Why is this so shocking to physicians? Because physicians think of lab values not just as measures of disease risk and progression, but as dynamic measures of disease risk and progression. In fact, as totally dynamic measures of disease risk and progression. But given how, what a high proportion of them are heritable, you gotta remember the genetic component to a lab value is static. We can predict it from birth, and it's not going to change over time. So this heritable part to the lab values is a bit of a sticky wicket, and, not, and physicians do not like hearing this. I mean, they're like, what does that mean? And, you know, 35% of physicians in the United States have practicing physicians have never had a course in genetics. And that's a mix of people who, you know, th there's no course at their medical school and they didn't take one as undergraduates and they, they don't know anything about genetics versus um, some where their medical school is in integrated genetics into every curriculum. So there is no course for it, but it's, it's really well taught nevertheless in their medical school. So 35% is pretty high, but it's, that's still a lot. Um, and so, Heritability is a deceptively simple concept. So if you think of the distribution of liability to some disease, asthma here in the black, the variance around this population mean is contributed in part by the genetic variation that individuals have, and part by lots of exposures that we know are really important in asthma. And so, so we've got this variance and so the, the total variance is the sum of this genetic part and the environmental exposure part. 
And if we, if we look at the people diagnosed with asthma down here um, from the black curve, and then, then just take a sample of their first degree relatives, well, on average, if there is heritability, um, those relatives will have a higher mean. And then a, a higher proportion of those relatives will fall beyond the threshold on liability to become affected. And so this is an indication of the existence of heritability. And that it's a deceptively simple concept, but at root, a lot more complex. So we think of the total variance as the C plus E. Heritability is simply the pr proportion C over the total variance. And so in, in broad sense, heritability, the you know, commonly you way people in the lay public think about it is the degree of genetic determination or the proportion of total variance that you can attribute to genetic factors. But really, the models that underlie this have very specific meaning. And so the, the narrow sense heritability, the, the more appropriate genetic definition, has to do with it being the proportion of variance attributable to relatively small and more or less equal effects of individual variants acting additively. So not interactions, so no gene by environment interaction, no gene by gene interaction, no huge effects with just a little bit of polygenic background. And all of the modeling is relatively robust, so it'll stand up to some departures on this but with big sample sizes, you have to be careful, and you know. So, so, but heritability is a useful concept for reminding us that that the, a lot of these laboratory values, our genetic variation is determining where we lie on these distributions, and in ways that that are really complex with respect to how the laboratory, how the measurement is used, the laboratory value is used. So. All, virtually all of these laboratory values get components from both the genetics and the environment. If you think of something like LDL cholesterol, what your genetics provide is predictive ultimately of a myocardial infarction. What your diet, how your diet drives LDL levels is also predictive. They work together in sort of a perfect way to make measured LDL a great biomarker for risk of myocardial infarction. But, but we have all kinds of laboratory values at the other end of the spectrum. Cystatin C is one of the ways that we measure kidney function. And every bit of the genetics, which are appreciable for cystatin C, in the range of 50% heritable, all of that is noise for how we use that biomarker. We would have a better biomarker that would be fully dynamic in telling us about kidney function if we just regressed out all of the genetic effects and looked at the residual. Similarly, we have some of, some of the things, especially some of these new metabolomic markers that turn out to be actually just a single DNA variant of a single protein. That's the metabolome. And it's really predictive of some disease because it's, yeah, that's, that's the cause of that thing. Now, we could do the metabolomic measurement, but we would probably just measure this better straight off with the DNA sequencing and look for the polymorphism, right? So the, the biomarkers, without the genetics, it, you, you don't really know what space you're in. That is to say, some of these, we want the genetics and the environment. Some, we, we really just want we just want the dynamic part of the range. Others, we can just use the genetics. And we can do that now. Plus, all of these omics, based on, in many cases, on different ways of doing sequencing, are going to give us way richer, way more informative laboratory values to use in medicine. And Man, these are going to come thick and fast. There's a lot of work being done to develop these. So if you think about it, polygenic risk scores, the N of 1 information that's returned to people, that's another kind of biomarker. 
So the rare variants plus the polygenic risk scores, they, these are coming into medicine to be used as prognostic factors for, for people developing disease. Measures of gene expression are so rich, and we can do those, we can do those in, in, in blood, and even though not everything is about what, what's in blood, we, we can learn a lot. Um, measures of the epigenome can be done via various kind of, via sequencing, and, and it's really important how the environment interacts with the genome. And measures of translational efficiency, um, measures of direct protein levels and metabolites, all of these are great opportunities for new biomarkers, and we can really deconstruct them and focus on the exposures that, so pull out the genetics, look at the exposures that also drive these biomarkers like gene expression, and also recognize you know, when we have dyshomeostasis because we're distending into a disease state, some of that, a lot of that changes the gene expression in, in lots of genes. So we've got a lot of components in this space of what we call environment. There's the internal environment. Things are getting messed up because we're descending into a disease state. And then there's the exposures, what you had for breakfast, uh, what, whether you had caffeine. All of those impact gene expression in lots of ways. So we, we can think of this, the faces and vases. We can use the genetics to highlight more of the outside exposures, more of the dyshomeostasis going on, and, and really use genomics and genomes in, in ways that, that can really move medicine um, in new directions. And the, the reason I'm so sure this is going to happen is because we're not doing it yet, and we're doing harm to people because of that. And it's got to do with the fact that a lot of our reference ranges were established decades ago in small samples of white men. So of the heritable labs, what proportion of them have mean values that differ significantly by EHR reported race ethnicity? Almost half. And this is, these are not necessarily small differences. Some of these are big differences. Um, and, and the African diaspora in particular, because they have so much more variation, they often have different variances as well as different means. So, so this, this same sort of thing can be used to represent what's happening, um, for example, with Europeans and African Americans with a mean difference. And then you see you know, the, the population with the higher mean much more frequently falls outside the reference range. Um, and, and this is heritable and static. And physicians don't always know that. So they see somebody outside reference range, driven largely by genetics that is benign, and they're thinking, oh my gosh, got to do a bone marrow biopsy on this person. So I, we've been working on this now for couple of years trying to get a deep dive and understand all of the consequences of this in not just our genetics data, but we can go into the 3.2 million people that we have electronic health records data on for up to 30 years. And, you know, on average, 10 to 15 years. And it's a sea of repeat testing, overdiagnosis of disease, underdiagnosis of disease, unnecessary procedures, not getting needed care, by that, because, because they're not diagnosed, so they don't get needed care. They get taken off therapies they should be on because physicians mistakenly think that they're responding poorly to them because of biomarkers that are just genetically, we're just in a different genetic space. So there, a recent paper from some of the young physicians who really took this to heart and looked at just a single polymorphism that has a big effect in African Americans, and it's common in white, lowering white cell counts. And, and so, so when a physician refers a patient for a bone marrow biopsy, and their only indication is a low white cell count, if they're homozygous for this allele, it's like never positive. So we, we were able to replicate this in many other biobanks, and there was like one person out of many 
a lot more than this um, in the paper that that this was just this is just from BioView that was positive. There's no no value in doing bone marrow biopsies in these people because if if their only indication is low white cell count, when there are other indications, so you can see we get a much higher return. So 130. Four out of the 243 were negative, but that's a much better return on the investment. Yeah. So, so where African Americans are not just having a lot of repeat white cell counts; they're actually getting unnecessary bone marrow biopsies ordered, and even at places where they should know about benign ethnic neutropenia. And the thing is, race-based reference ranges can't solve this problem because a third of African Americans don't have this problem at all. So you can't just lower the reference range for everybody who says they're African American or, looks gen or who looks genetically like they're African American because it's this allele, it's, it's this genotype that is the thing that drives this. And, and, and so this just get mag gets magnified unless you have the whole sort of polygenic distribution including these larger effect alleles. And it's not just unnecessary bone marrow biopsies. African American women have, it, lupus is one of the few autoimmune diseases that they are at higher risk for, and they do much worse than European women. But they, they get taken off the first line, ex, less expensive, um, easy to use therapy, because at the, fir the first time a physician looks, they've got low white cell counts, and so they, they get yanked right off of it. So they have much less time on this first-line medication, and it's the same thing for any of the other medications that do similar things. And, you know, that one polymorphism accounts in our entire electronic health record for all of the difference in therapies between African-American and European women. Um, so, so we, I think we have to solve this. And, you know, we were interested in the laboratory values as, a, you know, thinking about ways to get genomics into medicine even before this, but there's just some things you can't unknow after you've seen them. And we're, we barely scratched the surface of all the problems that these inappropriate reference ranges are really causing, so, you know, it's, it really is an iceberg kind of problem, and, and we, really, we really can't go on like this. Because I can tell you, I mean, it looks bad for transplants. The African Americans who do worse with transplants don't get to take those drugs that, for the anti-rejection when they have these variants. It's, it's, it's a cancer chemotherapies, too. It's... It looks like an astonishing problem in health equity that you can't solve without genetics. And I, it never occurred to me that we were so poorly equipped to deal with the diversity in our population. If you've ever seen these, this is just using genetics to look at how diverse we are. So this is within Europe, um, but it, in our biobank, the Europeans are all down here in this teeny little little corner here because we have lots of people with recent African ancestries. We, and these are just people born from 1905 to 1920. Going forward, we have a, a lot more diversity. And you can see where this is going. If you've ever seen one of these from Mount Sinai, it looks like this. And our projection is by 2030, this is what, this is what BioView will look like. So... We should be celebrating this diversity, especially after a pandemic like this. We need every bit of the diversity we have in our species for whatever's kind of going to come our way. Pandemics, global warming. But we have to be prepared in our healthcare systems to deal with it the right way. And we can't do that without genetics. Um, there, there, really, there literally is no way to do it without taking the genetics appropriately into account. We can do genetically informed reference ranges. We can remove the genetics from things that we don't need the genetics for. We can use only directly the genetics where, where that would be the best thing. So um, thanks for your patience and 
So these are my funders, and I tried to acknowledge my collaborators along the way. Yeah.